episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Uh, welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another fascinating guest uh, helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us. Um, today, we have the honor of being joined uh, by Captain Dr. Roger Herbert. Uh, who is the Robert T. Harris Distinguished Military Professor of Ethics at the United States Naval Academy. Uh, a 1983 graduate of Davidson College, Captain Herbert holds a Master's in Arts uh, in National Security Affairs from the Naval Postgraduate School, uh, a Master's of Science in National Security Studies from the National War College, and a PhD in International Relations and Political Theory from the University of Virginia. Uh, Captain Herbert received his commission through Officer Candidate School back in 1984, graduated from Basic Underwater Demolition or SEAL BUDS training, Class 131 in 1985, and reported to SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 2, which is a SEAL team that specializes in undersea operations for his first operational assignment in Naval Special Warfare. Uh, his operational tours include SEAL Platoon Commander assignments at SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 2, SEAL Team 8, uh, and the Naval Special Warfare Development Group. Uh, he served as Operation Officer of SEAL Team 8, Executive Officer of SEAL Delivery to Vehicle Team 2, and Naval Special Warfare Task Commander at SEAL Team 2. Uh, Captain Herbert was privileged to serve as Commanding Officer of SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 2, Naval Special Warfare Unit 3, uh, the Naval Special Warfare Forward Command in the Middle East, and the Naval Special Warfare Center, Naval Special Warfare Training Command. Uh, his shore assignments include Executive Assistant to Deputy Commander, uh, United States Naval Forces in Europe, uh, Executive Assistant to the Deputy Director for Information Operations, the Joint Staff, and the United States Special Operations Command Liaison to the United States Coast Guard. Uh, Captain Herbert, uh, in addition to all that, is a backpacking instructor for uh, the National Outdoor Leadership School. Uh, and prior to joining the Naval Academy faculty, he served as the head of school uh, for the Outdoor Academy, uh, which is a, a semester school for high achieving teens that focus on character education, experimental learning, and leadership development. Uh, Captain Dr. Robert Herbert, thank you uh, for taking the time to come on the show today. Ira, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great uh, that you're here. Um, you know, I, I, I'd like to start off as we typically do, uh, just by handing you uh, the floor for a little bit. Um, if you could uh, start off sort of by just taking us back a little bit from sort of the basics of, of where you grew up, uh, when you first got interested in military service, and a little bit of your sort of journey into the SEALs at the time, because I, I was sort of looking a little bit at the history and uh, you know, so while well, the SEALs go back, it's sort of technically to World War II and sort of formed formally in the early 60s, you joined uh, in sort of a period, which I'll, I'll say uh, it was a little bit before sort of the, uh, I guess, where the celebrity nature of the SEALs that we see today in movies and, and reality shows and so forth. Talk a little bit about what things were like uh, back in the early 80s when you joined up. Okay, great. That's an uh, awesome way of starting off. I would like to start off though with a dramatic reading, if I may. Please. <laughs> okay. Uh, these, uh, these are my own views that I'm about to express here. Uh, and they are not necessarily, uh, they do not necessarily reflect those of the DOD, uh, the U.S. Navy, or the U.S. Naval Academy, uh, or any other department of uh, defense uh, or government agency. <laughs> That was, I thought you were going to quote us from Aristotle, but that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, that was, uh, that was the best I could do. Um, but yeah, so t I grew up mostly in the Virginia, in Virginia, uh, and I, uh, I went to, uh, to Davidson College, as you said. Uh, my father served in the Navy for about 10 years, uh, and, and, you know, I think that he was he, he he probably would have uh, liked it if I were interested in the Naval Academy or or even NROTC or something like that. Um, I wasn't as a sixteen year old for sure. Um, so I went off to Davidson. And I was attracted uh, to Davidson by um, certainly the high academics, um, but mostly <laughs> for football. It, it was uh, it was just sort of the right size program for me. Uh, not too small, but also very very. They took uh, their sports very seriously there. Um, and, uh, you know, I was a fine student there. 
Um, and uh, I think that most of my attention really was on, on being a better football player than being a better student, but, uh, but I managed to do pretty well. Uh, uh, and I, I went as a pre-med major, uh, mostly because I lacked imagination. <laughs> and I was like, well, I get decent grades, so I, I guess I'll do that. Um, and uh, after my last football game my senior year, I thought, I, oh, I got to get serious about this now. I've got to go, you know, go do life. Um, and um, so I volunteer, um, amongst other things, while I'm doing all those applications, I volunteer at, um, at Charlotte Memorial Hospital, uh, where I, I discovered that one, I hate hospitals. Um, the, you know, the lights were bad. It smelled funny. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't care for doctors very much. You know, I was, I was a volunteer. <laughs> they were pretty mean to me. It's like, dude, I'm volunteering. And, um, and, then, and then the worst part of it was I, I learned that I didn't like sick people. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I, would have been the, I would have been the worst doctor ever in the history of doctors. Um, so, uh, so I'm having a little bit of an existential crisis here uh, my senior year at Davidson. Uh, and about that time, a friend told me about the SEALs. And like you said, nobody, nobody even knew what that was. Um, nor did I, nor did my friend. Uh, uh, but it, you know, the, the NFL wasn't calling, and it, it sort of sounded like a, it sounded like something like that. Um, and uh, I, I heard. I think the thing that attracted me most is that, um, you know, there was a huge washout rate. So I said, oh yeah, that's going to sound like a challenge. Let me do that. Uh, and that's about <laughs> that's about all I knew about uh, about the Navy uh, or about. Uh, the seals going in, um, and uh, and yeah, and so it was discovery after that, um, and I I had no I had no zero intent of making it um, of making it a career. Um, I just I, I just um, I I did enjoy it right away. Um, and uh, and then something I discovered uh, in during that that first tour, um, uh, as much as I did enjoy the work, um, what I discovered was I really enjoyed the the people I was working with. Mm. Um, so um, so seals are extraordinary people, I think. Um, I mean, they're just fun to hang around. They're, they're good people. They're, they're upbeat. They're optimistic. They're, they're friendly. They're not like what you would think, um, if you only have a, um, if you only have a caricatured version of what a seal is. And, uh, and I discovered that I, I just, I wanted, I wanted to stick around. I wanted to be around those type of people. Um, and, um, and I, I'm more or less committed, um, not to, uh, you know, not to as long as I did. I ended up serving for 26 years, uh, but I ended up committing to, to as long as I, um, uh, it, to, to maybe get to the point where I could command a SEAL team, uh, which would, you know, that's a, that's a good, it, it, that will end up being a 20 year commitment, you know, cause you command a SEAL team somewhere around your 15th or 16th year. Uh, you get a pension after 20 years. So you'd be dumb not to stick around after that. Um, uh, but then I was planning it. In fact, as a, as a, commanding officer at, at that time, I was planning on getting out and going off and getting my PhD because I had another itch I really wanted to scratch and that's I wanted to teach at the, at the college level. Um, and uh, I was, I was literally, and, and I mean, literally like, like the word is really used, not like 15 year olds use the word. <laughs> I, I was literally working on, um, on applications. Uh, my, um, on, on uh, September 11th, 2001, <laughs> and I'm um, I've got it. I've got a TV in the in the office watching uh, with CNN, you know, on mute, and I'm kind of looking up every once in a while, and I look up and I see a um, an airplane flew into the World Trade Center, and I go um, 
<laughs> I go, uh, uh, I turn up the volume and, I, and I, I go to my my senior enlisted guy at the command. Uh, uh, so every commanding, every every command has a uh, an officer who's who's the commanding officer, but also a senior enlisted who's like a really important person. So I go, uh, I go, hey, Master Chief, Master Chief, come here, come take a look at this. You know, some knucklehead uh, accidentally flew an airplane into a building and we're watching this and we watch the second one hit. Um, and uh, I, I, like like the, the rest of us who, who observed that, I was stunned. I had no idea what was going on. And my master chief turned to me instantly because he was a super smart guy. And um, I don't know why I have to tell this story with his accent, but I do. <laughs> He had this ridiculous main accent. He goes, well, Skippa, <laughs> there goes your PhD. <laughs> and, uh, and it's like, what are you talking about, Master Chief? Because we're going to war, Skippa. And uh, yeah, and so at that point, we sort of needed, uh, needed SEALs more than we needed professors. I'll I'll uh, I'll inhale at that point. I arrived. Yeah, talk. no, I, I you, you unpacked a lot there, and, 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 it's, and it's great because I'm going to go down each of these paths separately. But you know, um, you know, a, a short a short anecdote for uh, before I get to the question here. Um, so. Uh, you were saying, you know, you, you, you would have made a very good doctor. I probably would not have made a very good SEAL. Um, but, you know, about 20 some odd years ago, uh, the Discovery Channel had um, this uh, docuseries on about one of the SEAL classes. Um, and, you know, any 20 year old at the time, and I'm watching this, what would I do? I, I can get on the floor, I do some push ups, and I, I go over to my chin up bar over here. I'm like, well, I can handle some of this. And then the episode of Hell Week came, and I realized, no, I, I can't do any of this. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there's that, um, you know, when, when they get to the, uh, the, the parts of the episode about, about Hell Week and the, the commanders and so forth, they're shouting at everybody now, says, you know, you've got to do all the physical stuff. This is purely in here. Um, I said, no, well, I probably couldn't handle that either. Um, you gave a, uh, a speech, or actually a lecture, uh, a couple of years ago uh, at the U.S. Naval War College, and it was entitled uh, Courage, Can We Teach It and Can We Learn It? And you specifically spent some time talking about Hell Week, uh, about, you know, once again, this is not a physical thing. Hell Week's not even about the Navy requiring certain attrition rates. It's about courage. Uh, and then you um, dissect the topic of courage uh, into sort of four subgroups. You, you talk about uh, self-knowledge, uh, self-control, a, a tolerance for failing, and then ultimately uh, love and, and this sort of this, this formula that you create about sort of what makes the virtue of courage. Uh, just take us through a little of, of uh, obviously not the whole 50 minute lecture, but it, talk a little bit about courage and uh, SEAL team training. Yeah, I I forgot that that was out there. Um, uh, so yeah, um, I've been I have been fascinated with courage um, ever since. Uh, well, I mean, I guess we all are all our lives. It's, you know, it's a, an interesting topic. It's something that we admire. We wish we had more of, and all that. But um, uh, I was uh, asked to give a. Um, and I guess you know this anecdote from uh, from watching the video. If you actually did that, um, but I, I was uh, I was at UVA, University of Virginia, getting my uh, working on my doctorate, and uh, and the basketball coach, the women's basketball coach, asked me to to come in and talk to the athletes. Um, and it's like, oh man, that really that got me jazzed. It's like, yeah, I'd like to do that because I love athletes. And um, uh, and so. Uh, I went and gave the talk and man, <laughs> I was missing. I was, you know, I just was not hitting home. And, uh, and then, you know, that when you go and ask the Q and A and, and just crickets, nobody's saying a word. And uh, finally the, uh, the point guard who was the captain of the team, she felt sorry for me. So she asked a question and she goes, okay, I got it. Seals are all courageous and all, but can you learn it? Uh, or is this something we can learn so that, you know, we can go out and beat Duke. And, um, and I, I'm like, oh, I don't know, <laughs> I, you know, I never thought about it. Um, and, and, uh, and what's awful is, you know, you said you, you saw Hell Week and all that. I, I mean, I ran that. I was in charge of that. Uh, and I should have known better. Um, and so I've been thinking about it ever since. And, um, and the, the answer is yes. 
like any virtue, uh, courage is something that can be taught and it is something uh, that can be learned. Um, and so I tried to break it up into its, into its components. And, um, and as I was doing that, I, I reverse engineered this and I realized that's what we were doing. Um, that's what we were doing in, in basic SEAL training is, is we weren't weeding out the, you know, people who couldn't make it, which is what I sort of thought that, that SEAL training was. It, it's not about that at all. It's about making sure that the people who do who are you know stupid enough to keep going, um, have this have the ver the primary virtues of being a seal and 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 the center of that is courage and I would say that for any of the military anybody in the military the the uh, the, the essential virtue of the military is courage <laughs> so we ought to probably know more about it and um, and uh, so uh, you know I. Um, I backed up into into breaking it down, and uh, yeah, so so that first uh, component is self awareness, uh, knowing how far we can actually take our our minds, our bodies, our spirits, um, our our airplane. If we're flying an airplane, how far can you push this? And you're only going to know that by pushing it hard. Um, by, by testing those limits. Um, and that's what we do in BUDS. So, I mean, we just, we push them and push them uh, and, and we're getting closer and closer to where their limits are. And, you know, that, that limit is where you're going to fall over and die. And we all got it. I mean, there's, there is that point. They're, they're different for every person, but there is that point and everybody thinks it's here. And so as we're approaching that, you know, maybe the smarter ones say, that's it. And I'm not going to go anymore because you're trying to kill me. Um, and, and then, you know, those weirdos say, okay, I'm in it. And let me, let me try one more and one more step and one more step. And I reach down and feel a pulse. And sure enough, I'm, <laughs> I'm still going. And, and, and then we actually introduce them to maybe on the distance they can see yes that is where i would keel over and fall down um uh the other one that you mentioned um and you have to might have to remind me if i don't get them all the other one that you mentioned was uh, was self-control um uh, a, a chaos is a killer in um in in, in war and and um you know, one of the leading theorists of war, uh, uh, Clausewitz, um, he defines war as chaos. Mm. And um, I had a boss one time who said that seals thrive in chaos. No, we don't. <laughs> you know, nobody does. <laughs> but you just got to thrive better, than, more than the next guy, you know. Yeah. It's like running away from a bear. It's got to be faster than the guy you're with. <laughs> um, and, um, and so what we do is we introduce our students to chaos and you know that's the um you know if you're watching those discovery channel things that's what you're seeing is that chaos and um and actually it's very controlled believe it or not we 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 think really long and hard of how we're doing that mm. um we're not just you know being cruel for cruelty's sake um but we just introduce them to chaos and they have to figure it out um and and they struggle at first and they they try and try and try to figure it out and at the end of the day, what they realize is they can't control any of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they can control, though, um, and this, this is sort of the, the basic uh, insight of stoicism, is that what I can control is me. I can control my, my responses to this. And once you can do that, um, oh, you know, you're powerful. Um, and, uh, and then uh, the, the last one is love. Um, and I, I say that because I've sort of di pushed out the, um, uh, the, the, the comfort with failure, maybe into a different mm -hmm. idea. So I've, I'm right now thinking that maybe those three things are, are, are sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe an evolution in thinking or the need to shorten my lectures. I don't know. <laughs> so um, um, so um, yeah, that last one is love and, and you know, I, I, I wish I had a better word for it, but I don't, I don't. Um, and, uh, oh, in fact, I gave a talk on this yesterday and, and let me, let me see if I can remember that one too, but, uh, and, and can you teach love, mm -hmm. um, uh, and learn love? And the answer is yes, I think. And what we do in, in BUDS 
is we, we give these students things that are impossible to do uh, by yourself. And, and we're used to doing things alone and by ourselves. And, we, um, and so our students try and they fail and they try again and they fail. And slowly what you see is they start developing these cooperative relationships. It's like, okay, if we can cooperate just a little bit here, then, then maybe the suffering that these instructors are causing us will, will ease up a bit. And it does. Um, and, you know, at first you appreciate the fact that, you know, the, the skill of your friend is keeping you from, you know, from pain from the instructor. Um, uh, and then you reciprocate and then you admire your colleague. And at some point, uh, you know, I remember my hell week standing around a fire, one of the rare times that they're going to let you be warm. It was uh, Wednesday night of hell week, which is pretty much the time that nobody else is going to, is going to um, quit. And I'm just staring around the fire and, um, and, I'm looking around and for the first time, I'm thinking, these are awesome dudes that I'm standing here with. I, I really admire these people. Um, and then as this evolves, I, then, then you have this, then you have love. And, um, and, and I'll, I'll tell you one brief story, if I may, sure. um, and, and not a story that I'm, I'm intimately involved with, but, but uh, tangentially. Um, there was a um, there was a seal um, a seal who was awarded is killed in an action in Iraq. I think it was two thousand and five. Um, no, no, it would have been two thousand and six. I think <laughs> um, his name is uh, Michael Mansour. Um, anyway, a very junior guy, um, and. Uh, this the, the the story as related in the in the, the Medal of Honor um, citation uh, is that uh, he is in a uh, in a firing position uh, with two other seals. They're in a, a, a blistering firefight with some Iraqi insurgents. Uh, an Iraqi gets close enough to throw a grenade in. Uh, the grenade lands and. Um, and um, Mon uh, Mike Mansour puts his body on the grenade. Um, kill, you know, he 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 perishes, and and the other two seals survive. Um, so obviously, that's extraordinary. That's astounding. Sure. You know, who would make such a a, a choice? Um, but it also, it, it almost seemed like something non-seal like, you know, we're, we're sneaky guys and, you know, you'd think we'd find some other way of, of doing that without, without sacrificing our own lives. And I, I, I w was in Coronado at the time and, and Mike Munsour's family is from the San Diego area. So I went to the memorial service and, um, uh, Pay Officer Mansour's body was accompanied by one of the people he saved and he was at the uh, memorial service. And I asked him about it, um, you know, can you tell me more? And as he tells the story, I realized that no, this was, a, this was very, this was very seal-like. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, the, and it goes to love. The, the, the grenade actually hits um, Mansoor's chest and bounces off. One person could have survived that day and it would have been him. He could have easily rolled out of that firing position. The other two seals there could not. They were, they were going to be killed by that grenade, for sure. Uh, and of course, Mansoor is the only one who ends up dying. Um, but his, his, um, his last words as related um, by this person uh, who he saved um, were he... he and, and the person may, this is how he remembered it. And he acknowledged this might not exactly be how it happened, but, you know, memory works funny ways, especially in, in times like that. Um, but he describes uh, uh, Mike Mansour making eye contact with him. And his final words as he shuffles off his mortal coil isn't, you know, forgotten country. His final words were, oh, shit. <laughs> And, uh, and I'm going to get choked up again. I got choked up in class yesterday. Um, that is seal talk for I love you. 
um, and um, and that was an act of love. And so um, I think that if you if you read um, uh, tales of extraordinary heroism, and not just on the battlefield, anywhere, um, I, I, they're love stories. I think they're all love stories. Uh, I, I appreciate you sharing that uh, with us, and it's a an amazing story. And um, yeah, I mean, it's um, yeah, going back to this theme of courage and uh, these components of it, uh, just really. Of course, that's that's hard to comprehend. That degree, yeah, for, uh, yeah hardly um, any of us can comprehend that. Um, right. Yeah. It's, but it's. Uh, I, I, I thank you for sharing that. It's, um, there's important messages in there. Um, you know, one of the, um, I see, you know, you've had uh, an amazing um, career sort of from the perspective of the service and, 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 and all of these uh, components in terms of the training, in terms of running the teams and, and so forth. Um, but, but equally fascinating, I have to say, is, your, your educational journey. And you, know, you mentioned a little bit of that in terms of, you know, you started off as with this biology and you were going to do pre-med. Um, you know, you, you take a fascinating path uh, through your master's work. And I was reading some of um, your stuff. Uh, I looked at your, uh, your, your thesis at the, uh, the, the Naval Postgraduate School. It was uh, called uh, Bullets with Names, The Deadly Dilemma, where you get into uh, assassination theory um, sort of and, and, and policy and sort of the balance between where assassination is useful or there are basically policies that need to be looked at again. Uh, and then in your, your dissertation uh, at UVA, you, uh, this is entitled Cry Havoc, Rhetorical Mobilization of Foreign Policy Decision-Making During uh, War-Threatening Crises. Uh, you go into an analysis of uh, the way that leaders frame uh, policy decisions for the public and political communication and so forth. And then I've seen you write about Aristotle and Descartes. <laughs> um, talk about your just, I mean, you have so many interests here, a very broad set of interests, obviously you teach ethics now. Um, how did all this, uh, once, you threw, once you threw away sort of the pre-med stuff, how did all of these educational interests sort of come together? <laughs> Because they're very uh -huh. diverse, but, you know, they work together, let's say, put it that way. Well, they more or less work. I mean, being a great academic means you find a little tiny niche and you, you just drive down it really hard. And, and uh, my, my diverse interests are probably not that helpful in that regard. Um, and, you know, I'm still kind of a baby academic, right? I got my, my, I finished my PhD in 2016, so I haven't been doing this for very long. So I'm still trying to find my footing. But, um, but it, Okay, so take you on that journey a little bit, because um, uh, this is another uh, good story about uh, how how we can do wonderful things for people without even thinking about it. Um, and I'm I'm and and I'm I'm referring here to um, to Frank Tatey, Doctor Tatey, who sadly is no longer with us. But you know, I think we all have our our Dr. Katie's or, or, you know, that, that great teacher, um, you know, might've been in college, might've been in, in, in high school or even elementary school. But uh, for me, my Frank Tady is Frank Tady. And um, he, uh, uh, this was at the Naval Postgraduate School. And um, it, it, he was just remarkable. For the first time, um, he treated me as, um, as an intellectual, um, you know, nobody's ever done that before. I, again, I'm, 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 I was fine with the books, um, but I was not an intellectual, nor did I, <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't treated as such. And um, one of the things that Dr. Tatey would do is he'd walk into the classroom and he, he'd slap down a book. And he'd say, hey, let's talk about this next week. And it had nothing to do with the class. And, um, um, and so, and, and these, were, these were not easy books. Uh, one of them was, I, I remember this one, he, he, he threw down uh, uh, John Rawls's uh, Theory of Justice. 
Um, this is not light reading, <laughs> although it probably was for him. He, he was a wacky smart dude, but he, he throws down a theory of justice and he says, hey, hey let's talk about this next week. Um, so I said, okay. Um, and, and I did everything I could. I, I read it, uh, I sort of, um, talked to him about it. I didn't get it, but it didn't matter. I mean, the fact is that, that this guy is treating me like I'm some sort of, you know, intellectual. And I started really getting excited about this. Um, and, uh, my, my studies there, uh, were national security studies. So this is a form of, of political science. Uh, so I'm starting to be introduced to things I didn't look at or think about before. Um, that dissert or that, that thesis that you mentioned was like really bad, uh, I think, <laughs> but you know, really, it got, it really cool. It, well, it so it was well received by the school. Um, so, you know, they, they, uh, um, they, they thought it was decent. I didn't, um, as I look back. I, I did at the time. I thought it was brilliant. Uh, but now I kind of look back and go, oh, gosh, I, I hope nobody sees that. So sorry, I write. <laughs> but anyway, um, so we, um, so I'm starting to be really excited about this. And, and there was one day I remember I was sitting around in a, um, in a little student area and Dr. Tatey comes in and he sits down and he goes, he goes, well, you know, I don't know, maybe you're going to go off and be an admiral someday. That's fine. But you, what you really should do is you really should be an academic. And he walks out and, <laughs> and I'll tell you that stuck. Um, that stuck. And I said, no, that is what I want to do someday. And, um, and so I always kept that on my horizon. Um, like I say, I, I had to put it off. I thought I was going to do it, uh, as a, as a commander. Um, I had to put it off because of, of 9-11 and, and feeling obliged to stick around. Um, you know, but at some point, so I, I did stick around and I'm glad I did. I had, I got two additional command tours, which were just amazing uh, opportunities. And, um, and I loved my time and I'm glad that I, I was able to serve uh, during a time where our, our country really needed us. But, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, on 9-11, I think we needed SEALs more than, than professors. Honestly, maybe now we need professors <laughs> more than SEALs. I don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is a, a time in our, in, in the, the, um, in our nation's history where, um, I, I think that it's, it's good to have people who can straddle both of those worlds. Um, and, uh, and so I said, no, I, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to do it now because I'm getting, I'm getting too old for this. And, and by too old, meaning you don't have to be a, a 20 year old to, you know, to, to read a book, <laughs> but, um, but the way academia works is they, they want younger people. Um, they want people who are going to be able to, to contribute to human knowledge for a long time. And, and, um, as a 50 year old, which is how old I was when I started my, uh, my doctoral studies, um, you know, I, we only live this, we only live for so long. We got we to acknowledge there is going to become a time where I'm no, no longer contributing. Um, and so, uh, so I needed to do it then. And, and so that's when I decided to do it. Um, I, I actually started off uh, exploring um, philosophy, trying to get into a philosophy program. Uh, and a couple of actually awesome philosophers who I still kind of work with, they talked me out of philosophy. Um, and uh, mostly because they, they didn't think I could get into a good program. Um, I had no background. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I did have a background, particularly in international relations. And I was able to get into a great school, University of Virginia, uh, with that, uh, which also has an amazing political theory um, uh, program. So that's what brought me into that. Um, and, um, and, and I, I'm, again, I'm talking too much, I, but if I can add one little, one more weird twist. I like, there. That, I like weird twist. This is cool. Okay. <laughs> okay. So weird twist is all, all my life. I'm thinking I want to be an academic and now here I am and I'm studying at a great school with great people um, uh, wonderful mentors. Um, and, but I'm also realizing maybe academia was not, was not exactly what I, I wanted to do. Um, I'd always been in kind of in a tribe, you know, and, and academia is a, is a little bit of a lonely, uh, 
place. I mean, you have your classes, but it's not the same kind of uh, working environment. Uh, and that's not a, a hit on academia. It's just a, that that's the nature of the business. Yeah. And I'm realizing I'm missing that. Um, and in a, in a, in a, fit of academic recklessness. <laughs> I took some time off and went to a, a, a Knowles course. <laughs> and, uh, and it was there I realized, I think I really want to get into outdoor education. Yeah. Um, and then that brought me to both being a Knowles instructor and um, uh, to the Outdoor Academy, this, this wacky little uh, school that combines a 10th grade with backpacking and whitewater paddling and rock climbing. Mm -hmm. And that we all wish we knew about when we were in tenth grade, um, and and I decided that's where I was going to stay forever. Um, and I did pass up on some uh, some some excellent um, you know tenure track type of of jobs for that. But then you know then the Naval Academy came around, and and I I could not say no to the the Naval Academy. This is an extraordinary place, and and what an extraordinary opportunity it was for me to teach. Um, well, to teach students like the, the students that, I, um, that I'm currently working with. Um, now I'll inhale, that was my journey. <laughs> it's a great journey. And I, I, wanna, I wanna get to the Outdoor Leadership Academy in a, in a, in a little bit. I just, uh, I, was, I have a, a serious question here. I just wanna throw this in while we're sort of at this stage because I, um, I lined up your um, uh, military sort of uh, timeline with, with your studies. And I noticed there was a little bit of overlap uh, there, I think, during some of your master's work. Uh, any interesting stories about having to tell a professor you didn't do an assignment because you were doing an amphibious insertion or you left your homework in the boat? Or <laughs> Sorry, serious question. I have to do this occasionally, but uh, uh, anyway. <laughs> I, I wish I had thought of those excuses. I've never... I've never been cool as hell excuses to give, I got to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, let's get back to uh, other serious things. But I, I, I do want to um, uh, actually you know, let's do the outdoor leadership uh, academy now because I, I there's some, there's interesting things there. You know, um, I, I'm sitting here in um, uh, downtown Philadelphia, and a couple dozen miles uh, east of here in New Jersey is this place called Tracker School, uh, run by a guy named Tom Brown. Who yeah, I, sure. They did a um, Tommy, it was Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, there was a movie, Benicio del Toro. It's called The Hunted, which is sort of loosely based on that. Um, but I've always wanted to, once again, uh, I would have made a bad seal, but I also, I, when the, if the system ever does go down, I'm surviving five minutes <laughs> or so. I need this training uh, significantly. Talk a little bit about um, what you do with the, the Outdoor Leadership Academy. And, um, you know, we, we also touched on... Um, it's about a year ago. I touched on this this theme. We were wearing this sort of uh, forest therapy and, and outdoor therapy, and, and sort of the miraculous thing this does to kids that have emotional problems, even prisoners in certain cases. Sort of this reconnecting with nature uh, in, in the way sort of it changes the mind and, and, and helps them focus and everything. Talk about a little, not just sort of the physical stuff that you teach, but also any interesting sort of the mental, uh, psychological. Uh, components of, of that whole program it's gonna be kind of interesting to hear about yeah um first of all when we're done with this interview please tell me about the tommy lee jones um movie um and, and i i do know about um uh, brown and his his program um and, and it's pretty extraordinary and he has he has actually worked with seals and and, and other special operations forces uh before um he, he's he's out there and in, in in the uh, I mean, he's pushing the envelope in terms of, in, in a good way, in terms of what he can do in the in the world in the woods. Um, I, I, let's do my, my quick quote from the movie. The way because it's the coolest quote in the movie. It's like, "I will teach you to survive, or you will not." So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Off the top of my head, I don't know why. Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, he's he's really talented um, guy, and and far outside of um, of my skill set. Um, but no, so my uh, uh, my attraction to the outdoors though is a, is a little bit different. I mean, that's uh, for me. That's where God lives. <laughs> you know, I just I, I'm just at my best and when I'm in the woods. Um, 
and, uh, and honestly, as I was thinking about what I wanted to be when I grow up, um, or after, after the, the SEALs, it was either going to be, I wanted to be a football coach, uh, I wanted to be a Knowles instructor, and I wanted to be a college professor. And um, I, I ended up kind of ended getting both. I did, or two, two out of three, that ain't bad, um, according to Meatloaf. And, um, and so, um, uh, um, so, so, I mean, I, I kind of, I would have uh, Knowles um, catalogs next to my, my, you know, next to my, uh, on, on my table, you know, and, and would read through it and, and just fantasize about, oh man, I would love to do that. I would love to do that. I'd love to do that. Um, uh, because it really is an extraordinary organization. Um, and, and the thing about Knowles, uh, and I, I mean, Outward Bound and, and all sorts of other wonderful programs is, um, you know, the, the, the outdoors is your classroom. You're not just learning how to, to uh, put up your tent and how to, uh, to, to cook well and how to flourish uh, in the back country. Um, you're also learning how to, um, to lead. Um, how to follow, um, uh, because it, it takes a lot of work. Uh, you're learning courage, uh, going back to courage, because it, it's, you know, it's, it's hard out there. Um, and, and it can be dangerous to some extent. Um, and uh, there, are, there are real risks, and courage requires understanding that there are known risks and acting regardless. And that's really what you have to do um, uh, in, in the back country. Um, so, um, so it's an extraordinary teacher. The back country is a teacher. It doesn't necessarily build character. It kind of exposes it. Um, and, and you learn so much about yourself uh, in, that, um, in that environment. Um, I was, uh, um, I have a fond memory of my, so I did a Knowles course. Uh, it was an executive leadership course. And executive means you're an old guy. <laughs> so you're only going to do it for a short period of time because the, the typical Knowles course is a, a month long. Um, but I, I did this course and um, uh, the, the short course and, and to, to my astonishment at the end of it, um, uh, one of the, um, the folks who was kind of a higher up there at Knowles suggested that I uh, put in for the instructor course and, um, and I say to my astonishment, I mean, uh, I, my, my resume, my outdoor resume, you know, it, it, you might think it's extensive, but not compared to uh, the average Knowles instructor who's, you know, they've, or at least the Knowles instructor that I thought, you know, I had this picture of another guy who does, you know, the nose route, but route of El Cap you know, at night, backwards, barefoot, you know, whatever, um, which really isn't quite true, but, uh, um, uh, but anyway, so I, I, I put in the package and, and was accepted and, and went through the course. And, um, and this, again, is sort of where I realized, like, no, this is what I need. I, I need to be doing more of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was one of my, um, one of my colleagues uh, who I was going through the Outdoor Academy, or I'm sorry, Knowles with, um, who um, it was about six months after our instructor course. He goes, he, he sent me the uh, link to an application to the Outdoor Academy and uh, to be the head of school there. And he goes, he, yeah, forget about that. You know, forget about all that tenure track professor stuff. This is what you ought to do. <laughs> and he had a little smiley face emoji next to it. And because I think he meant it as a joke. And, and honestly, I didn't open it. And I was clearing out my emails. And you know, this is how the universe talks to you, I guess. Right. Let's clean out my emails and, and, uh, um, and, and I see this and I, I pop on the, the thing real quick and it's like, you got to be kidding me. There's such a thing. And so I, I put in an application and gosh, darn it. I, they, they were, um, they probably, I'm amazed. I got past, you know, even the, the first iteration and you let alone made it to a finals. And when they, they offered me the job, I was one astounded and too grateful. Um, and, and I think it, it worked out well. And, and the Outdoor Academy, again, it's, it is this, 
um, they use the outdoors and living in community as a way, a mechanism of, of learning these things about yourselves, mm -hmm. learning these things about uh, um, living ethically in community, uh, living ethically with the natural world. Um, and, um, uh, and yeah, and it's, and, and yes, all, and all your high school things you have to do. And, and this is not therapeutic. This is actually for, um, you know, they say for high achieving, uh, teens. Um, uh, but it also, I, I um, but I, I, I guess all teens need some therapy. Um, so, so this was, uh, um, uh, you know, th this, this was a little different than those therapeutic programs, but I am familiar with them and, and work closely with many of them when I was at the Outdoor Academy and they are extraordinary and they too have this, this fundamental insight that the natural world can, can teach us remarkable things, um, about ourselves, about it, uh, and about being human. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a thing we touch on a lot, actually. We've, uh, with all this technology and uh, whether it's, uh, it's biotech or infotech or all the other neurotech, uh, we're forgetting about sort of that couple billion years of nature that's <laughs> been doing very well without us on this planet. So uh, yeah, th th there's a lot of very, uh, very important things that uh, to, to relearn, let's say, uh, from the natural world. And uh, I, I need to do more of it myself, I mean, especially getting these, these kids outside <laughs> often after this pandemic thing. But um, uh, Roger, I, I wanted to go in one other direction. And we talked about this a little bit before the start of the show, because we do touch a lot on the future and, um, and what's coming next. And, you know, you... Um, you know, you teach uh, about ethics, uh, policy, uh, a range of subjects, uh, foreign policy analysis, political thought, and so forth. Uh, and there's, you know, this set of tools that has existed, um, some military, some, some not. Um, and as you know, I've been talking to many of your colleagues uh, in, in, in various parts of the uh, of the military and department events and so forth about sort of these new stuff that's coming down the pike, which is going to change the face of combat and war. And it's going to look very different uh, in the coming years. Hopefully we won't have wars in the coming years, but there's, you know, this, this technology, whether it's uh, drones or directed energy or artificial intelligence that can run a bit aircraft carrier and all this stuff. Um, just, you know, go in any direction you want, but I'd love to get from, you know, perspective of teaching ethics and uh, from different levels. Um, what, what, what do you think about uh, when you look out 10, 15 years at some of these emerging tools and, and how does that maybe alter some of your course, uh, you sort of the syllabus uh, of the things that you, you're getting across to, to your class? Yeah, so we've, we've included that um, in our syllabus um, uh, sort of the, the, the future of war and what those ethical challenges um, might look like in the future um, with, with technology. And they're all fascinating. I, I think AI is both fascinating and scary um, and, and really, cool to, <laughs> really cool to think about in a, in a sort of a science fiction way. Um, but that, of course, that science fiction is upon us. Um, and and are, are we ready? Uh, you know, at what point does technology, is technology too far ahead of us? It's always been ahead of us. We've always had to catch up to technology on the battlefield, whether it was arrows at, at first um, or, or, or inter, intercontinental uh, missiles. So we've always been playing catch up as, to, to um, technology on the battlefield. And, and that's going to continue. Um, and right now, we, we do look closely at AI, at, um, at computer network stuff. But we only really spend a week on it. <laughs> and you, you need to spend a course on it uh, to, to do it right. Um, and, and I think some of my colleagues may even teach um, uh, some electives on that. And that's, that's what it would demand. 
But the other when the other side, when you look at the future of war, is don't think about technology. Uh, I mean, think about who is confounding us the most these days. Um, uh, who, who we've actually been fighting, um, and, and it has not been a high tech war necessarily. So we are challenged uh, in an asymmetric way um, by by people using very low tech. The the one insight that I would have, I don't know if it's an insight, but uh, the, my thought that I have looking at both of those um, is that these ideas that uh, have been around for millennia uh, and that we continue to think about uh, and, and continue to, to, um, to put into a different context, they all work. They all, they all give us leverage on how to employ um, these systems um, morally. Um, and, uh, and so we can't, we can't get, um, we can't go follow these shiny objects and forget our roots, forget about the fact that we have, that when you are, uh, on the battlefield, uh, I mean, taking a life is no matter what, it's morally problematic. Uh, you don't have to be a pacifist to know that. Um, and, and we need to think about this, whether, um, whether uh, we are taking an enemy combatant's life um, with, um, with a, a, an artificial intelligence robot <laughs> um, or, or, you know, with, with our hands. Um, as, as, you know, as our ancestors did. Um, we have to recognize that we, we, cross a, um, we cross a very important moral boundary. And we have to make sure we're thinking about this right. Um, we, we in the West, certainly, um, and, and actually in most civilizations across you know, the globe and over time, but certainly we in the West and definitely we in the military, because we can order our people what to think. Um, we think that all humans, no matter what, you know, have, have great, equal and inalienable worth. Um, and, and this confers rights on them uh, and rights impose duties. And, and one of the premier duties uh, or, or rights that they possess is the right not to be harmed, which imposes a duty on me not to harm them. And if I'm gonna cross that boundary, I've got to think through this right. And again, we've been thinking about this for millennia. So the, I'm in my course, I'm less interested. Uh, in fact, I fight some of my colleagues in this. I'm less interested in, in computer networks and AI and all that. Um, I'm more interested in making sure we've got the basics of moral reasoning down hard. And, um, and, and the work that I want to do right now um, I guess as I as I find myself as a baby uh, a baby academic still still trying to find my foot footing, is I want to focus on that. I want to focus on how we um, how we ground ourselves firmly, um, certainly as a military, um, but but you know as a people in in these basic fundamentals of of right and wrong. Because uh, if we go forward from a great foundation, uh, it's less likely we're going to make mistakes. It's less likely that these technologies um, are going to get ahead of us too far. They're still going to, but too far. Gotcha. Um, Roger, you mentioned uh, Professor uh, Frank Tetzi uh, uh, earlier on as being a, a very important influencer as you developed along this path. Um, I'd, I'd like to, you know, I did, as we did at the beginning, I'd like to give you back the floor for a little bit. Um, obviously, you've, you've met a lot of people now in academia, in the military, in the SEALs teams, um, through the Outdoor Leadership Academy. Um, 
take some time just to, to mention, shout out to other important people in your life, mentors, influencers, family members that have been really um, instrumental uh, along your path uh, that, you know, if it wasn't for these people, you would be uh, practicing medicine right now or doing, or doing something completely different. Um, oh my, I, do you have, <laughs> do we have another hour? <laughs> no, I know. Um, wow. So we, I guess, let me think chronologically. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate, not everybody is, to have two loving parents uh, who um, uh, I admire them both um, profoundly and and uh, and for different reasons, and I've I've learned so much from them. They have been and continue to be um, my mentors. Um, my dad was my first football coach, um, but there I had a I had a coach at Davidson, uh, Bob Estock, who. Um, uh, you know, when I think of that combination of courage and love, uh, I think that I think uh, Coach Estoc is is uh, where I learned that. Um, in in school, it was Frank Tatey, uh, definitely. Um, in uh, uh, and for the reasons I cited, and you know, we we all have those opportunities, and and we have to be we have to be careful not to lose them. People are out there listening. I'm sure Frank. Uh, has no idea uh, that 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 comment was actually going to put me on the direction of of academics, and and it did. Um, so I think we all need to make sure we're taking those opportunities when we can. Um, uh, let me see. So after that, in the military, you know, you know I I don't. Um, I had one. Uh, I, I can say I had one person I would actually call a mentor. I had lots of leaders I admired. Um, one person I, I considered a mentor. No, I just thought of another two. Okay, so uh, one is is a uh, uh, Bob Schultz. He's a uh, he was sort of one echelon above me always uh, during my career. So during my first command tour, uh, he was my Commodore. Um, and, uh, but mostly he was my friend. He's, a, um, he's also a, a guy with some somewhat wacky background. He was a, a Stanford philosopher, um, turned SEAL, turned hippie, turned, <laughs> turned, he, he was also a Knowles instructor. He got me into that as a matter of fact. So there was one. The other one I'm thinking about in the military uh, actually is my wife. Um, she's, uh, um, so she's a, a retired admiral, um, which is one rank above the, the rank that, that I achieved. Uh, we are always kind of together and I retired before uh, she made a uh, flag officer, but um yeah, yeah, but she, she, you know, people say, "Hey, my wife outranks me," and for us, it was true. It's, <laughs> if, I, if I didn't take out the garbage, it was a UCMJ violation. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, no, but she's uh, she, so we we've, uh, and I, I imagine, she, well, I hope she would say the same about me. So we we would spend, you know, we had different types of conversations around our household that aren't typical. Um, so she's also been a, a mentor. Um, uh, beyond that, so out, outside of the, the uh, I, I had a mentor at the Outdoor Academy. Um, uh, really, he was actually the founder of the Outdoor Academy, um, a guy named uh, Ted Wiesman. And, um, oh, <laughs> I got a prop. Okay. There's the Outdoor Academy. And this is what I reminded myself, WWTD, <laughs> what would Ted do? <laughs> and it just, uh, this is where I learned how to be an educator was mostly from him. Um, I think, I think, uh, oh, and I've got a new, I've got a new mentor. I, I've got a, uh, there's, a, there's a, a scholar out in Australia, uh, Dean Peter Baker, who is, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, actually, I don't know, he's probably about, 10 years younger than I am. Um, but, um, uh, but he, uh, he's sort of, he, he's become fascinated with my background and he's, he's been bringing me into a lot of his work, mm. uh, which I'm very grateful for. And, and, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm right now, um, uh, co-authoring a, a book, uh, with him, which would be my first book, assuming nice. we get across the finish line. So, yeah. Outstanding. And I'm probably missing a bunch of people, but um, yeah, 
<laughs> it's it's a great group. It, it it sounds like a really great group, and it, I, uh, yeah, you know, it. Um, I, I think it it demonstrates sort of the convergent <laughs> uh, affairs uh, that needed to come together to create uh, who's sitting in front of me now. So it's a, it's it's a really fascinating. Uh, journey and story and you know with everything whether it's the outdoor academy and 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 the teaching and and, and the writing now I just really uh, wishing you the best with all this because it's 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 a very exciting next chapter uh it sounds like for you um for for everybody that's uh, going to be listening to this episode uh on our podcast or watching on the youtube channel uh you've been uh, listening to Captain Dr. Roger Herbert, uh, Robert T. Harris, Distinguished Military Professor of Ethics at the United States uh, Naval Academy. Um, Roger, I, I really want to take the time to thank you for, for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us about all these, these fascinating topics. Um, thank you for doing what you do. And uh, since at the beginning, uh, obviously, thank you for your long service to our country. And as we say at the end of every show, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow through everything you're doing now. Um, it's, it's really very, very inspiring stuff. And I want to thank you again. Ira, thank you so much. And it really was a pleasure um, chatting with you.